quoi Yes, sir. I'll, I'll hold it until I give it. I'll give it to you. Right oh, you don't have your own. Okay. All right. Cool. Actually, Father Tom. Tom. This might be more complicated to put on, so I'm good. You put that on because he's after you. Okay. Oh yeah, just yeah. Oh, right on. Oh yeah. Give that. Hey, Pat, take that one. I don't. I don't need it because I'm hard. Uh, she did say you something, I guess, emailed you to print for the afternoon session. Okay. Oh. Whatever. Yeah. Don't worry about a thing. Because uh, no. everything is yeah. going to be alright. Don't worry about a thing. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome again. Um, it's beautiful to see you. I know many of you were with us for liturgy this morning, and it was a wonderful service. Um, we want to thank Deacon Mark and his incredible team again for all the work that they put in to organize this weekend. I want to thank also our staff. Uh, Anna Grace is not with us because she's down at her spiritual father's funeral, Father Anthony Carbo's funeral today. And Alina Bobina, um, thank you so much for the hard work. Danny uh, Steeler, and where's Charlotte? And Charlotte as well. Thanks, staff, for your hard work. Uh, for Deacon Eugene and Deacon Nicholas also, who constantly are serving our community in all that they do. So this morning we are very thrilled to have with us again uh, Father Tom Sagalakis. Uh, can you say that? Sagalakis. Sagalakis. Or you just say Sag. Father Sagi. Father Sagi. Um, and his beautiful wife, Presbyteria Pat. Um, so, Pres Pat and I go way back. So far back that when I was reintroduced to Presbyteria Pat, um, I just remembered that I have to hit the record button here. When I first uh, was reintroduced to Presbyterian Pat, she has a great memory, unlike me, and she was like, we know each other. And I said, no, we don't. <laughs> and she said, yeah, we do. And she went downstairs, and she went and got an old phone, uh, uh, photo album. She brought it up, and there she was as a counselor at summer camp, and her and I are just hugging hard and taking a great photo up in uh, summer camp up in Wyoming. And then, of course, uh, I got to know Father Tom. He was my wife's uh, Goya youth advisor at her church um, where she grew up. And their two children, if you, you saw that last night in the photo, were um, our ring bearer and our flower girl in our wedding. So I go way back with uh, Father Tom and Pres Pat, and they've been, if you will, at least spiritually connected to the journey of St. Spiridon's. And so it's just really wonderful to welcome them. Their bios are in your retreat booklet. Um, not long uh, ago, uh, I got to start connecting with George Papageorge. And um, George is an amazing, amazing 
uh, witness of the Lord and uh, his thoughts on marriage and family and relationships and just how to grow as a Christian are incredibly insightful um, and interesting, like he engages you. And so for those of you who did the 8 date series, uh, this incredible team with a few others at the Family Wellness Ministry out on the West Coast put that together as well as a recent series on parenting. You can get all that information on the Metropolis of San Francisco's website. And so we're really, we got the power trio here with George as well. Um, the good deacon has got my announcements for this afternoon. And so um, a few things that you need to know. Uh, you know where the restrooms are. Uh, we do ask that you don't bring food into the sanctuary. If you did, hide it really well because I'm going to find you. Um, uh, and lunch is going to be after this talk in the fellowship hall. Uh, when we go to lunch, uh, something for you all to know, about 20 minutes into lunch, our service project for the day will commence. And before we break, I'm going to give you a few more details about that and how that's going to go. Um, Deacon Mark, did I get everything I'm supposed to get? All right. Without further ado. Thank you, Father Evan. It is such a joy to be with you, to worship with you this morning, and just to have this time together. Um, before we begin the formal part of our presentation, I get to open us in prayer. And this short little quote from our dear friend, Father John Backus, who's um, now retired, but many of you might know him. He was at the LA Cathedral for many years. Um, he wrote this, and I thought it was very fitting and telling as we begin today. Fast from criticism, feast on praise. I should say, remember the drive-by that George talked about and the lean-in? And then remember what Father Tom was sharing about what voice are we listening to over Great Lent and what voice are we listening to throughout life? Um, think about this in terms of that. How are we going to fast and how are we going to feast? Fast from criticism, feast on praise. Fast from self-pity, feast on joy. Fast from ill temper, feast on peace. Fast from resentment, feast on contentment. Fast from jealousy, feast on humility. Fast from selfishness, feast on service. Fast from fear, feast on faith. Fast from bitterness, feast on forgiveness. And fast from discontent and feast on gratitude. So let us stand and let us begin again with the prayer of St. Ephraim. And remember that this is our grounding prayer, our grounding prayer for Lent, our grounding prayer for this retreat, and our grounding prayer through life. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Lord, Lord and Master, Master of my, my life, <clears throat> take from me the spirit of sloth, faint-heartedness, lust of power, and I will talk. <clears throat> but rather give to me the spirit of chastity, humility, patience, and love to your servants. Yes, yes, Lord, Lord and King, King grant, grant me to see my own errors and not to judge, judge my brothers and sisters. sisters. For we you are blessed into the ages of ages. Amen. 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 Please be seated, and I'm going to pass it right on to our dear George. Okay. Good morning. Well, I have a question for you. How are you? Oh, wait a second. How are you? <laughs> so we want to get grounded. And if whoever wasn't there last night, you're probably saying, I don't even get why you said that a second time. But we're going to get centered and get connected to ourselves because we even think about that question that we reflected on last night. It's even in light of these prayers we just prayed that we realize that even how we are sometimes feels powerless to us sometimes not even feeling well or not feeling centered can feel far away from us. So as we just look to these prayers, if anything ever feels impossible during this journey, then you are completely qualified to be an Orthodox Christian. 
because it's in our powerlessness that we find a savior, right there. So, as we think about our time this morning, I want us to take uh, a little bit, if we took all of healthy psychology, I do believe, and I think healthy, sensible ways of thinking, and we had to like package it or format it into one way of understanding human behavior, I think we could talk about sports psychology. So what do we understand about sports psychology? Oh, good. We have football right here, right on. Yeah, it'd be a good football field right here. And um, so let me just ask the question on that. Sports psychology, we've heard of sports psychology, right? And so then when you know, what you know about sports psychology, why does sports psychology exist? What's the target? Why is there a need? Particularly when we think about professional sports, you have athletes that are equipped, stacked, head to toe. They have what it takes. Why in the world would they need sports psychology? What's going on? Yeah. To work, on their mindset. to work on their mindset. So we're saying in this very physical world of athletics, this idea of what's going on in the head plays some kind of part in it. Now, what part does the head play in sports? What do we think about when we think about what goes on in the head that can affect sports? Okay, motivation. So how much are they in gear? Are they connected enough to know how to take their intention and turn it into something on the field? What, yeah, what's that? Belief. Bel belief, say more. Okay, so here's this thing I'm going to do. Again, am I connected enough in some belief that I can do it? Because if I'm believing I can't do it, it's going to show up on the field. So then now we get into sports psychology right there. If I entertain a belief that I can't do it, even though physically I can do it, what ends up happening is you can't do it. You get disabled from yourself. There was a great story of a second baseman. I think he was for the, in the, for the Cubs, and he played about three, three or four teams. He actually was a Golden Glove second baseman. To get Golden Glove, it means you're one of the best fielders in professional baseball. And, you know, the throw from second to first isn't that far. And he was a great fielder. And so this one day, he just had one of those routine throws, and it went off funny. It went over the first baseman's head and hit a lady in the head. Yeah, bro. And she like got knocked out. Like it was like, oh no. Okay. Months and months went by this golden glove second baseman. You could look on YouTube. It's all there. And he would go field it. And right when he's ready to throw, Father Tom talked about it last night when he talked about brain science, which he's going to talk about with this disconnection. And what happened was every time he's ready to throw, what happened? What if I hit someone in the head? He's perfectly skilled. He has what it takes. He's playing for years. He's ready to throw. What if? What if? And right when he got into the what if I throw it over his head, what if I hit someone in the head, it disabled his body, and he literally would, from second base, not far to first base, he actually would like throw it and like bounce four times before first base. So what are we saying about sports psychology? What we know about the science of sports psychology is when you get in your head, it messes with your game. Okay. Now, when we think about that, then we say all of, if I'm using this formatting, what we know about psychology and what we know about the spiritual life, we could say the same thing. I could certainly say it about myself and maybe you could say it about yourself. When you get in your head, when you get in your head, it messes with your game. The game of life, the game of relationship, the game of how you show up, the game of performance, the game of, of what's going on in your life, this idea of getting in our head. So this idea then in sports psychology, when they pay the big bucks to see the sports psychologist, really what they're doing is finding a way to take this separation because they're way up here, woo, way up in the head, and they try to find a way, they call it the zone, get in the zone, which is then to connect them to their heart again. Now, I, I, I'm, I like baseball, so uh, in the baseball world, you may notice uh, some guys, they call it dressing the plate, when they get up and they have their bat and they're at home plate and they step in and they start uh, digging in, they take the bat, they might tap it four times. All of that is sim similar to prostrations. <laughs> they're getting in the zone. They're, they're, they're doing kind of a sacramental uh, 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 ritual that will help them get connected to the present moment. So that athlete, it is not random how many times they're tapping the plate. That is their, or tennis, how, I'm, oh, give that ball back, bounce it three times, hit the, t they're getting in the zone that all their, the time zone they're in is like, I'm right here, I know this, 
or baseball, oh, there's a ball coming my way. That's all I'm concerned about. Once they go, but what if I get, don't get on base, they did a what if, they tighten up, and literally physiologically they tighten up and they, they lose their swing. So this idea of, and we could kind of think about ourselves, when do I get in my head? How hard is it once I get in my head to get out of my head? It's like Hotel California. Do you know that song, Hotel California? It, right? It's just something like, you know, it's, you get the invitation in, but you never leave. Okay, some of us have Hotel California right up here. Okay? So I want us to take a look at what it looks like when we're in our head. What are the characteristics of being in our head? So life in the head. Overthinking. Do you recognize that one? So in youth culture today, if we had one characteristic for kids under 30, uh, you know, like we had a pandemic, there was a virus. This is the virus of youth culture, is overthinking. What else is true? Focus on outcome. When we get in our head, just like we said, what if I don't get on base? Now we're out there and I'm not right here. Life in our head, this is very common. Again, similar to what's happening, probably for all of us in different ways. Youth culture, this is the thing that's happening. A mix up where a person's sense of worthiness is tied to their performance. Now we start understanding sports psychology even more because sure, I wanna get on base, yeah, I wanna have a good batting average, but when who you are and what you are and how you feel about yourself is tied to how you just did, then every at bat is life or death. Everything you do is tied to how'd it go. Guess what happens, let me ask you, what happens, what kinds of things happen in our life if we tie our worthiness, our sense of ourselves, our sense of our self-esteem, sense of how worthy we are or not, we have it primarily tied to how we just did performance. What comes of that? What would be true for us when we tie those two things together? Ego. Okay, ego. So then say more about ego. In what way? Okay. So, when you, so that's a good day. On a good day, you, when you do well, mm. <laughs> and everybody else is, uh. Okay. What happens on a bad day? What happens on a bad day? Crash. Oh, and hard. So then what we have in cl clinical terms, when worthiness is connected to performance, what do we have? We have mood disorders. I'm okay on a good day of performance. I am awful. And not only is my performance awful, this is the problem with, with life in the head. I am awful on a bad day of performance. We don't distinguish between performance and self because life in the head puts those together. Now, we're talking about sports, but we're talking about how sports psychology applies to life. So we can have a good day parenting and go, I don't know what they're complaining about. This is so easy. And then your kid turns on you. <laughs> and then you plummet. Or in whatever way, it could be work, it could be test taking, it could be whatever, right? Okay, what else is happening with life in the head? We're, the time zone when you're in your head is either past or future. Now again, clinically speaking, mental health, from a mental health perspective, if our being in the head, and some of us might toggle back and forth, some of us land in one zone or the other, what kind of emotional life do you have if you live a lot in the past? So past would be th things like regret, dwelling on past mistakes. What, what, kind of, what kind of emotional life do you have if you're in the past? What's that? Depression. Depression is high when you live in the past. What happens, what kind of emotional life do you have if you live in the future? Ding, oh my, I got an anxious group here, I love this. See, that's good. Now we're talking, you are part of the community that we all relate to. We know how to future trip, right? And so, and then we raise kids who know how to future trip, and then we're a family of future trippers. Now, again, if we even look at uh, generational psychology, what kinds of things are going from generation to generation, sometimes we have parents who were in their head and we kind of felt the vibration of their anxiety because anxiety is taught. It's modeled and caught, okay? So we have to decide what time zone we're in. Now, again, and Father Tom's gonna do the brain science on this in a few minutes, but there is kind of a primal panic. When you're in your head, you will regress back to your most primal instincts. We get panicky, we get fearful, we even get mean. And you could be a non-mean person and it's surprising what comes out in us. I don't know what the highways are like in Colorado, but I could tell you California, 
I, I, I do like the seven deadly sins while I drive on the highways. Like, I, so even road rage would be a perfect example of what kind of person I can become when they do that to me in my lane. So even this idea that in my head, I start getting triggered in a way that I start becoming a regressed, I regress backward. I get, I devolve, I don't evolve. And some of my biggest regrets as a parent, I've got a couple. <laughs> One of them is what I've done behind the wheel with my kids in the car. Talk about Kiri Leson. The Lord have mercy on who they see I become. Why? Because when I get in my head, I'm lost. And what's so funny about being lost is when you're lost is when you think you can control everything. And that can show up in a lot of areas. When we're in our head, we get controlling because we're driven by all sorts of distortions. So then we start taking on characteristics of being critical, irritable, rigid. The thinking process when we're in our head is rigid, is black and white. So we even think about that, even our Orthodox faith, because our faith has so been handed to us and it's so um, available to us. And that's the biggest gift ever. But if you come from another tradition, sometimes you, you can be happy you found this one. But we, if we have rigid thinking and become Orthodox, we have to be very careful. Because once we become polemic, once we become almost irritable for Jesus, once we become critical for Jesus, I'm going to use my rigid thinking for the kingdom, we're off a degree. And we're going to miss it because life in the head is not life in the kingdom. And so we think about this sports psychology and what happens when we're in our head. And then finally, simply said, oh, no, yep, projection. Now, projection is something that Sigmund Freud coined the phrase when he talked about defense mechanisms. He had really cool defense mechanisms. Funny thing about old Sigmund is that he thought he, that he invented it. Projection, but he didn't. Um, a guy named Jesus kind of brought it on the scene. We'll get to that in a second. But uh, So what projection is, is I'm in my head. All kinds of things are bouncing around. It's triggering me like crazy. And instead of, as Father Tom talked about last night, returning to the heart and listening, tuning into the heart, we stay in our head, and what happens when we're in our head? Amazing things happen. There's a superpower that happens. However, it's superpower that is to your destruction and to this destruction of everybody around you. What's the superpower? 2020 vision on people's defects around you. You will see them. You will know them. You will detect them. You will be an expert on everyone else's defects. So projection is when I'm triggered, which means something in me is unhealed. When I get triggered, let me say it again, something in me is unhealed. So it's my opportunity to go to the healer to help me deal with what's unhealed in me. Projection would be something feels sick in here. Aha, it's you. That's what's sick. It's you that caused that. Aha, it's you that brought this on and why I feel this way. We talked about blame last night. It's all in that constellation of finding the answer to what's wrong with me in you. And that's what projection is. Freud used the phrase, Jesus said, hold on. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye when you have this honking plank coming out of your own? I mean, he just painted that picture like this plank's coming out. Oh God, that speck really gross. God, do you know there's a speck in your eye? And everybody sees this plank coming out of here. It's like, we have to see this kind of embarrassing. Like, we could even use a little ego to go, I better cool that one down. Why? Because projection takes over, and we want to just solve the problem by solving everyone else. We leap over our own heart, and we leap over our own, um, what we could say, unhealed or sick parts of our being. So as we think about this, then we could say what we're talking about today and through this weekend is the journey to the heart. And uh, anybody ever do an Ironman? Oh, you d you've done four of them? 
bro, you're lying in church? What? 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 Four half. Four half, mar- uh, four half Iron Mans. That makes you Iron Boy? <laughs> I just, that what it is. I, 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 no, I, I didn't even that. Make- no, I meant that in the best possible way because you're so young. I just thought, okay, whatever. Woo! Okay. Awesome. You're like four halves ahead of me, so I'm all good. Right on. Okay, that is so good. Or it can make your, like, anyway. So anyway, I'll stop doing the math. Okay. So, so, right, yeah, exactly. Drop the shovel. Okay. So what do we know? So what's involved in Ironman? 2.4 miles swimming. 112 mile bike. 26, so whole Maryland, that's an Ironman. Even half is good, bro. Don't even, don't. <laughs> Amazing. I talked to Father Tom one time. In fact, I was on the phone. I happened to be in Tiburon, which is in Marin County, across from San Francisco, Sausalito area, all that. Um, Michael Bato lives over there. Anyway, I was visiting. And I'm driving, and we were, just happened to be talking on the phone. And it was right when Robin Williams had died, committed suicide or whatever, and he's right from that area. Like the, the tunnel that goes from San Francisco to the wine country and all that is Robin Williams' tunnel and all that. So he's like a local guy. And we're just talking about how tragic it is. And we just got on this conversation about, wow, what, what must have been going on for him? And, and we kind of got on this whole thing of like, you know, was he so disconnected to not have the reason to live anymore? And this is when Father Tom used this uh, this little thing that I'm going to share with you, and literally I've used that in every, like I speak in schools and in Google and all the kinds of places where I do wellness talks, whatever, and I've used this, and I talk about Father Tom in Seattle, and, uh, but he's right here, woo! And um, so what he said was, he said, you know, he goes, George, you know how Father Tom talks, you know, George, ever think about this? Like, okay, so, you know how in, no, 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 oh, yeah, 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 oh, go, go. oh, 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 yes, 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 oh, okay, so, so, stop, 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 oh, God, that's it, oh, Jesus, oh, thank you, okay, so, so, no, 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 okay, 26.2, you have that on your bumper, that's when you run a marathon, you put a bumper sticker, half marathon, 13.1, he goes, just think about 27 centimeters, I go, Father, what are you talking about, I'm literally driving right by the bay, and what's 27 centimeters? He goes, that's the race we have to run. So what's 27 centimeters? He goes, that's the distance from the head to the heart. That's the Ironman training that we're called to do. Pretty cool, Father Tom, by the way. Right? That's what we need to be in training for. And if we have lean-in training, lean-in Lent, then by all means, we're saying, i got to take that journey seriously every day. Isn't that sick? Yeah, sick. That's sick. That is just sick. Oh, yeah, that's sick. Thank you, Jesus. That's sick. Okay. Okay. Stop, stop, stop. <laughs> so, from the guy that goes from the head to the heart, he's going to tell us a little bit more about it. Let's hear about brain science. I'm not a very smart guy. Someone uses brain science. Can you hear me out One, two, three. Oh, now you're on, you're on. I'm on? Okay. I, I muted myself, so I didn't scream. So he, here's the deal, okay? Yep. <laughs> I keep going back to the beauty of our church. We think we're so cool because we spend trillions of dollars going into outer space, and like George said, the deal is, in sports science, the deal is what we said yesterday, that you and I are created in what? In God's image. You and I are a temple. Did you wake up to today and think you're the temple and within you is, is the Holy Spirit? This is what we're talking about. So we spend so much time and money going to outer space and the church is telling you the most difficult thing that no one talks to you about, ever. From here to here is not that far. It's to eternity. And that's kind of a wild thing to think about. But as we pray, as we connect, and as we consider some of these things that the brain science is showing us that are, that are supporting what the fathers and the mothers of the church have told us for 2,000 years, but now the brain science and the psychologists and this guy, Vander, have you ever read this book? It's pretty thick. I just read two sentences. I couldn't do it after two sentences. <laughs> but it's the, the, body, <clears throat> the body keeps score. And, and you wonder, the body keeps score? Tell me how somebody's driving down the road and there's a railroad track and, she, and it just stops. You, you can't go over the railroad track. True story. One of my clients. Tell me that. I'll explain a little bit of that in Sagalaki's Brain Science 101. So
So, anyone ever, anyone ever heard of the amygdala? Tell me what, tell me what the amygdala is. Emotional center. Well, you guys raise your hand. Tell me what the who, what, what do you think of amygdala? Lizard brain. Lizard brain. Fear. I'm going to throw that out. I'm going to teach you a new thing today. It's going to change your life if you practice this the rest of your life. The amygdala is a, as a gland and, or an area in the, in the brain. If you put a straw through your uh, eye and a straw through your ear, it'll intersect in the back of your brain. And that, I think, is a God-given thing. We don't know how to use it, though. The thing the amygdala do, does, write this down. If you have a piece of paper, write this down. I want you to practice it. The amygdala looks out for threat or danger. Real threat or perceived threat? Is that threat of that railroad track there? No train to the right, no train to the left. She stops dead track in her, in her tracks. Because of the trauma she had when she was 10 years old, her dad got blown over by a, rail, by a, a train and died, 10 years old. Amygdala looks out for what? Real or perceived what? Threat or danger to myself. And I really think it's a God-given thing because God wants us to be connected and united and one and peaceful. So, if you think about that, I'm going to do brain science with your fingers. So the brain science is the amygdala. Amygdala in Greek is uh, uh, almond. It's an almond-shaped gland. I'm going to put your finger up. I'm going to do brain science with your right arm. So the amygdala is your, right, your, your thumb. If you put your four fingers, the four fingers, the prefrontal cortex of your brain, the logical, the, the thinking, two plus two equals four, uh, don't put your hand on a stove. If you, if you wrap that around your thumb, think about your, your elbow as the, the brain stem. Everyone, uh, everyone put your arms out. Come on, want everyone join me with this. Okay, it's really important. You're going to see why you, when you go home today, you're going to be doing this exercise for the rest of your life. And if you practice it well, you're going to change your life. So if you think of your brain stem, I don't know how I'm talking. I'm walking. I don't know how that happens. It's a miracle. It's a mystery. You tell me how that happens. I don't even know what my next word is going to be. Maybe you wish I did, but I, <laughs> maybe, maybe I wish I did too. We'll see where this goes. But so, it's sick, it's sick. But this fires and just tells the body what to do. So check this out. So if we're in the desert and I'm walking with all you guys, I'm in the, I'm in the front, and all, I see, all of a sudden I see a snake, what's going to happen? <laughs> Everyone flip it up. Flip, flip it up. Your prefrontal cortex flips. You disconnect from your head and your heart. Boom. And you feel it in your body. It flips. You don't have that much time to figure out, is it a real snake, a fake snake, a poisonous snake? Is it going to get me? Is it going to kill me? I don't have time to look in the dictionary. It just acts right away. Boom. And you know where that thought goes? It goes in an envelope in your brain. You don't have to remember, remember all this, but it goes in the envelope in your brain. It's called the hippocampus. And it gets stored in there. And this is what happens when we get hurt in life, knowingly or unknowingly. I would get flipped like this because I grew up in a family that we were poor. My dad was a shoe shiner. We barely had enough food. If I knew you as a, boy, a, a friend who was a boy or a girl, I would never take you home because I was afraid, because this would go up, because the threat of you, remember how I talked about yesterday? of me being connected with you, and I thought if you really knew me, you'd be disconnected. You'd want, walk away from me. So I disconnected and I pretended I played a game. So when this flips, you have a choice of how to respond. But you don't. Because a lot of times when you flip, it becomes programmed in your body. And when you flip, with anyone flip with anger or frustration or fear, or feeling like I'm second class, or I can't do this, or like George said in sports, this guy he can't, he can't swing the ball, you flip. So you're in, you're in your head, there's no connection. It's like this disconnect, like I said yesterday, that happened with, with Adam and Eve. They disconnected. Were, we, were you cr uh, created to be disconnected? No, so we reconnect. So let me tell you a story I share with my wife, and I want to let you hear Father Mel Weber speak about uh, how we get out of our heads. <laughs> and into our hearts. See, that just happened right there. You see what happened? Her amygdala popped. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for... I, I, told, I, 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 I told Father Aaron, please sneeze in front of her so I can prove the point. <laughs> Was he a real threat? He's a real threat, not a fake threat. He's a real threat. <laughs> no, 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 no. 
<laughs> That's sick. <laughs> no, but pay attention. When this happens, what you do is the way you respond to that threat or fear is pretty prescribed. And most of what I've seen as a therapist, as a priest, as a father, as a husband, it gets flipped and you act the same way you did as a young, as, as a young person. Well, just like yesterday when Adam was asked, check this out, where are you? He flipped. And he had to make a decision how to respond. The more we can learn to listen to the Lord, because yesterday we, we were talking about who are you hearing? If I hear the voice of fear, if I hear the voice of shame, if I hear the voice of not good enough, if I hear the voice of my, I'm in trouble, I'm done. There's no way you can listen to Jesus. Because at the same moment, if we get time to talk about this later on, this is what happened to, to, to Lazarus. When Lazarus was asked to come out, I can't prove it. But at the same time, when he was asked to come out, there was another voice that came in. You know what the voice was? The voice of what we talked about yesterday, the evil one. Don't believe him. Dead people don't walk. He's a liar. You hear those voices sometimes? It's too much light out there. It's too much work. So when this pops and we respond to old ways, we're in trouble. But at the same time, the Lord is saying, can we slow down so we can figure out how to respond to this trauma or this triggering event? So here's the deal. Is we have to pay attention when we get triggered in any regard to listen. I really believe we rarely, as a therapist, I don't know about you, when people get triggered and they go in there, trauma response or the anger or the frustration or the depression or the woe is me response, I've not really heard too many people say, I want the, I'm asking the Lord to help me find another way to respond to this flipping when I flip my lid. When I flip my lid, I get overtaken by the thoughts that usually are not good, usually not healthy, usually get me in trouble, usually is not reflective of Jesus and his will. So I want you to hear Father Mel Weber listen um, how he talks about um, really, um, and before you do that, because here's the deal. I, I brought these here because I, 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 I talk a lot about the frequency of, of Christ's voice. And what George was saying, like, when these batters, or when you as parents, or you as friends, as single people, married people, whoever you are, when you don't hear the frequency of Jesus, this is why confession and repentance is so important, because this is, what is it? Here, you know what that is? No. It's an E. So this is an E. If I put dirt on here, it would, it would not have that frequency. It'll muffle. It would not be the perfect resonating frequency. The Lord within us has his frequency. And the thing is, when we're around people that have the frequency of Jesus, the frequency of love, we can just walk by them, just hang out with them, and then before you know it, this transfers to this. You can barely hear it. And that's what happens when we're around Christians that love. Listen to what Father Mel says. But I'm going to read you what it says. It's Theophan the Recluse, and this is what he says. You've got to get out of your head and into your heart. Right now, your thoughts are in your head. And God seems to be outside you. Your prayer and all your spiritual exercises also remain exterior. As long as you are in your head, you will never master your thoughts, which continue to whirl around your head like snow in a winter storm, or like mosquitoes in a summer's heat. If you descend into your heart, you will have no more difficulty. Your mind will empty out and your thoughts will dissipate. Thoughts are always in your mind, chasing one another about, and you will never manage to get them under control. But if you enter into your heart and can remain there, then every time your thoughts invade, you will only have to descend into your heart once again, and your thoughts will vanish into thin air. This will be your safe haven. Don't be lazy. That's one of those. Don't be lazy. Descend, he says. 
You will find life in your heart. You will find life in your heart. There you must live. If I were to rewrite any part of that, I would probably change that penultimate sentence into you will find eternal life in your heart. I think the heart actually resonates with the kingdom of heaven. It's as if it's an antenna tuned to the right frequency. The heart is there. The trouble is the mind dismisses it and says, nothing there. And I'll tell you why it does that, at least as far as I can see. The mind hates the present moment because it can't control it. The mind loves to be in control and can't control the present moment, so it only controls, it can only control the future and the past. And the mind will always take you either one way or the other. The mind will not bring you to the present moment. However, I think it's true to say that we can only meet God in the present moment. Because if you meet him in the past or the future, it's sheer fantasy. And God doesn't enter into fantasy. You can't meet God in fantasy. You can meet a replica God that you've just made up in fantasy. That's easy. And we do that a lot. But the real God? Huh. The real God you can only meet in the present moment. But I'm going to... triathlon, right? The people who play sports. There's no coincidence that St. Paul talks about us as athletes. And my prayer is that we can learn to practice to realize when we flip our lid, when we react, when we get hurt and we have to put a face on our face and not really tell people what we're really experiencing. Because if I tell you what I'm experiencing, I don't know if you'll love me. I don't know if you'll be by my side. I don't know if you think I'm a good priest. So I have to pretend. So when I flip my lid, when something activates my amygdala because I think I'm going to be in danger or threatened by something you say or do, this is, this is what's happening in America right now. If I brought somebody here with a Biden hat, and I brought somebody over there with a, with a Trump hat, you know what's going to happen? And you know what's going to happen? Two beautiful people trying to talk. And I'm telling you, you listen to me. When you try to talk, when your lid's flipped, you're done. Because that's what you do when George says yesterday, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to start blaming, and you're not going to ask yourself, what just happened? And I'm going to tell you, if you really, with your spiritual father, with your, if you have a therapist, you have friends, Talk about something just happened. And I have to tell this story really quick about a carrot. I had some friends, priests, over for, for brunch. And I, was gonna, I told my, my wife, I said, I want to have the breakfast on my own. And she said, no, 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 no you, you, you can't. I'll do it for you. I said, no, I want to do it on my own. No, I'll do it. And she goes, I said, Pat, I'm going to do it on my own. I just want to. I said, OK, OK, I'll make, I'll, I'll make muffins. OK, make muffins. You want to make muffins. I want to do it myself. You make muffins. So, so I said, she said, what are you going to have? I said, I'm going to have some yogurt, some, um, um, some yogurt, some granola, some, cut some fruit up, bagels, blah, blah. And I'm going to have scrambled eggs. Where are you going to put the eggs? You know, I'm going to put zucchini, <laughs> zucchini, bell peppers, onions, and carrots. She goes, she goes carrots? Carrots? You don't put carrots in eggs. Oh, I thought carrots in eggs. You don't do that. I don't put carrots in eggs. I'm like, we had this, 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 uh, time I was doing this fashion, I had carrots in my eggs. And she, oh, he, she, she goes, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And, um, okay, there it goes. I'll use this one. So, the next day, so she's, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, you, you want to do it? Okay, I'll just do the muffins. Go ahead and do the, the eggs. Put the carrots in, okay? I'm going to put the carrots in. So the next day, I'm, I, and my, my amygdala didn't flip there, right? I wasn't that much in danger yet because, you know, the, the, so the next day, uh, we're getting ready to, uh, the guys are coming over, had the bagels cut, everything else set up, the, cut, the fruit's cut, and uh, she has the muffins. I'm getting the egg out, and then I'm, I'm, um, I'm sorry, something's wrong with me, maybe. Um, so I got everything ready. I'm getting the eggs out. I'm sauteing the onions, sauteing the bell peppers, sauteing the zucchini, and then I got the carrot out. And she looks at me. You're not going to put the carrot in there, are you? <laughs> and 
how easy it is to do what George said yesterday, to blame. And I'm telling you, that's the first thing we all do, because we all learned that in the garden with Adam and Eve. And, and, and thank God, because the guys were coming in like five minutes. And you know how you get when you're in a funk. <laughs> this is what happens. You disconnect. I'm not myself like, when I'm like this. So I said to her, I, I, I really, I, in a kind way, I kind of recouped. And I took a deep breath, and I said, I can't believe you said that. <laughs> <laughs> After that, I can't believe you said that. And then I, I said, I can't believe how that really messed me up. It just, destro- it just destroyed me. A carrot. <laughs> a priest. Destroyed. <laughs> Five minutes, we're having brunch. <laughs> Whoa. I'm going to put a face like this, like, okay, everything's great, buddies. Um, and I, let me tell you the secret how, you've, how you take on the evil one is you expose the power. The guys came in, the first thing, not to disrespect her or me, to expose the story. Because the devil doesn't want us to tell these stories of disconnect. The devil wants to keep it secret. So if we have safe people, we can talk about this. It's so important. Because that diffused my, my, usually I'd be messed up over a carrot for one day, two days maybe. I don't know. You guys have your own carrot story. <laughs> your own flipping the lid. And that's what we're going to do right now. We're going to talk about, if we can, it's personal or it's not, about how you're, what it takes for your lid to flip. When are you walking okay and all of a sudden something happened? Ah! When did it happen this morning? When did it happen yesterday? I'd like for you to think of a story, how your lid flips, because you know what, really quick, is God is there to help you heal that. And we rarely listen to the Lord to say, Father Tom, this is about you feeling insecure. This is about your growing up feeling vulnerable and embarrassed. This is your feeling about not feeling sure of yourself. We'll figure that out. Take a deep breath. It's just a carrot. It's just a carrot. And I can't tell you how many carrots ruin lives. Oh, yeah. I did. And it was good. And all, all, the, all the priests said, oh, my gosh, I'm going to do this for the rest of my life. I'm going to use carrots in my eggs. I just want you to know, when I fix eggs now, I slice them really, really tiny, and I stick them in. So I'm... I, it's... <laughs> And then Father Tom Googles eggs with carrots, and there's like 60 recipes. So just let you know, I, I raised my hand. There was a foul. I did it wrong, and I should have responded to the carrot like that. Okay, so we're going to have a little time to just meet people around you to talk about this. And what we want you to think about is describe a time. Put that in your head. It could have been this morning. It could have been this week, or it could have been months ago. When flipping a lid, the amygdala pop showed in your lives in some sort of relational interaction. It could have been with your husband, your wife, your parents, your sisters, brothers, boss, employees, neighbors, friends, in-laws, relatives, any of your relationships. And I want you to think about that moment. And then what did you experience and notice and feel? So you don't necessarily need to talk about what it was. You don't actually need to show the carrot, but you need to talk about what it did to you inside, the feeling, the experience. What did you notice? So you'll have about eight minutes, six minutes, ten minutes, five minutes, we'll see, uh, to look at that. Think about that right now, because I want you to go in the conversation thinking about an actual time that you flipped, and, the, and really you'll feel it in your body. Or when somebody else in your life flipped on you. Either one, you notice when somebody flips, I do this because this is what the devil wants. He wants to disconnect your head and your heart in sports, in life, in relationships, boom, and then we got to put a face on. Okay, so find your people around you and uh, maybe in groups of three, talk about that. And if you want to mix around, go ahead.
gentlemen, shh, really quick. Pay attention. I think that if we had almost a spokesperson for every group, we'd have a lot to contribute to this discussion. Um, I want to mention two things before we go to the next section. I think we see, you know, the church fathers call it Logie's Gate. When we get in our head, and they really warn us that it's a kind of disturbing place to live. And that a lot of, uh, yeah. Okay, so, the, so yeah, the church fathers use what the Greek word for logic is. They're not saying that logic is a problem. What, they're what the church fathers are basically saying is, here's orthodox sports psychology. And they say that just like our list we looked at in the head, if you're stuck there, you'll run out of answers. Life is not found there. So they use the word, well, you speak. It's a cool word. If you look that up, you'll find all kinds of teaching on basically what we unpacked a little bit of the church has been teaching about for a long time. Father will like spell it for you during some sermon coming up. Um, but no, 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 no. So just to wrap up this portion, you guys discussed all sorts of things that were important. Um, I want to mention two things. One is. Uh, all that we will get a biblical story and that's a really amazing icon of the parable of the Samaritan and the whole thing is depicted there and he's 
starts as this like young, good-looking uh, man over here, and he goes through the whole journey of the, as you know, the parable. And check out hope, but in his life journey, his whole life, look, look how that journey aged him, because something happened on life's journey that was totally unexpected. If we think about our own life, very often the most defining moments are the unexpected moments. Things that define us very often come from unexpected moments. And what do we know about that story? The unexpected going from Jerusalem to Jericho. Uh, St. John Christom talks a lot about this parable and it gives us a lot of insights on it. And, and one of the things he says is, starting from Jerusalem to Jericho is our life story. We start by being made, we have the thumbprint of God uh, in us all. We, we, we start in the holy place being created by God. We go on life's journey unexpectedly, you can see right here, that the, uh, the thieves come and uh, tackle him down and rob him. And it says they strip him and leave him half dead. And he's laying there in a ditch. You know that, how that story goes. Unexpected, there is stripped and left half dead. And what we have here then is, um, then we have, because in this parable really is the story about God. Uh, click it once. No. Uh, the human story told here and the God story told here. In a sense, we'd say, if you want to have the right insight on your life story, we'd get to know this parable. If you want to have the right insight on understanding God, the God story, it's found here. Because the parable goes on to say, as you're probably familiar with the parable, that then he's laying in the ditch and the established religious folks come by and see him laying there and they kind of look and what, what's it say in the scriptures? They walk over to the other side of the road. And, and they do what? Yeah, a drive-by. And religious guy number one does it, drive-by. I've got some, you know, spiritual things to do. It doesn't get messy like that. Another guy drive-by, and then it says, as you know the story, why it's called uh, the parable of Good Samaritan, and Jesus picks the figure who would be the hated figure to the people he's telling it to, the hated culture, the hated religion. The guy's on the outside of the club, and that's the Samaritan. And the Samaritan comes along, and it says he, see, he, he goes there, he sees him, and he has compassion on him. We're going to unpack that in a few moments. And as the story goes, beautiful, because this whole story of the church. And as St. John Christom gives us insight, that Samaritan is the story of Jesus showing up on our road and going where we are seeing us and having compassion, and then taking him to the inn. The inn has a name on the front of the inn. Let me see. Oh, St. Spirit on Greek Orthodox Church, Loveland, Colorado. That's the inn. So that's how that story goes. But we want to take a look here, if we can, on that there's two sides of the road in life. What, in some ways, we could say the drive-by side of the road or the lean-in side of the road. Or we could say two sides of the road. The head side of the road, the heart side of the road. And even as a church, we'd say, what side of the road is our church built on? What side of the road is our family built on? Drive by, lean in, head, heart. I want to take a look at this, though, and as we zoom into this part of the icon, and St. John Chrysostom says the thieves are the demons, the devil's work, attacking the guy. And if ever you were sort of minding your own business and these unexpected things happen, very often the demons are trying to bring you down. So I want to take a look at this because something that the church fathers teach says this. You're mistaken if there's ever a time when a Christian does not suffer persecution. This is the teaching of the Holy Fathers on the passions. You are beset without even knowing it, for our adversary as a roaring lion, as Father was talking about last night, walketh about seeking whom he may, may devour. And you think of peace? On one side, self-indulgence presses me hard. On another, covetousness strives to make an inroad. My belly wishes to be a god to me in place of Christ. And lust would fain drive away the Holy Spirit that dwells in me and defy his holy temple. I am pursued, I say, by an enemy whose name is Legion and his wiles untold. It's a quote from Virgil. And hapless wretch that I am, 
how shall I hold myself a, a victor when I'm being led away captive? Quote from, bless, uh, from uh, Jerome. St. Jerome's words tell us, now this is my point here, that the evil one uses a man's passions to destroy souls. The Latin word for passions is passionis, which means our sufferings. The Greek word for passions is pathos, where we get the word pathology. So in essence, the devil uses our issues to bring us down. What's your pathology? I've got a big book in my office, and if you want to spend time, I could, we could figure out your pathology if you want. But, so we all have them. We all have these issues. We all have these, these fractures, these things that some of us even inherited because some generation passed it on. However we got it, we got it. And whatever our issues are, we have them. That's not news. Here we're saying how we end up in the ditch is that the enemy uses those issues, somewhat, sometimes the ones we hide. Adam used fig leaves, I think, or, or animal skins to hide his issues. We use things like success and all sorts of things, distraction to hide our issues. Nonetheless, the enemy uses our issues to bring us down. Then it goes on to say, the teaching of the Orthodox Church Fathers may be summarized by this parable. In the city, there was a courtesan. Anybody know what a courtesan is? Yeah, it's like a really a high-class prostitute, kind of oxymoron, but yeah. Um, so, like, very popular uh, prostitute. Business is booming, okay? And she lives in a city... So there was, a city, it, 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 there was a city that this courtesan had many lovers. And the governor came to her and said, if you promise to be good, I'll marry you. She promised, and the governor brought her to his home. Her, her, uh, she promised, and the governor brought her to his home. But her former lovers said to each other, that ruler took her to his house, to his house, let us go to the back of the house and whistle for her. Then when she recognizes the whistle, she'll come down. When she heard the whistle, she stopped her ears and withdrew to an inner chamber, shutting the door fast behind her. Abba John explains that the courtesan represents our soul. Her lovers are the passions. The governor is Christ, and the inner chamber is the eternal dwelling. Those who whistled are the demons. Behold how her soul took refuge in the Lord. And so what we have here, if we click it once, is that, that, that the enemy is looking to figure out what kind of whistle, what kind of frequency from a different kind of voice gets your attention. might be familiar. It's not the front door. It's going to be the back door so no one sees it and how he could tempt us and hook us into responding to that whistle. Part of our job in Lent is on this journey of trying to absolutely say, Lord, have mercy on every part of me, front door, back door, every kind of voice, every kind of whistle. And so we see here that what the scriptures say, that this poor guy was beat up in the ditch, left stripped and half dead. If we put stripped and half dead in clinical terms, stripped would be what we call shame issues. If you ever feel stripped, what a shame issue is, like guilt would be, I feel bad about what I did. So I, I could feel bad about what I did and I might do a course correction because I feel bad about what I did. Shame is, I feel bad about who I am. So when I make a mistake, do something, crosses the line, and I feel guilt, that I could survive that because I feel bad about what I did, I'm gonna correct what I did. But when we're, when we're stripped, like this guy in the ditch, I make that mistake, and again, we plummet, we crash, because we believe that it exposes how bad we are. I feel bad about who I am. And very often, what happens is when that, when that sort of spinal cord is hit, the shame trigger happens, that's when we go into flipping our lid, hiding, and making sure I never want to be around that again. 
And so that's a shame issue that kind of the devil can use to keep us down, stop believing in the hope, stop believing that that could apply to us. And then we have half dead. So the Apostle Paul says that the very things I don't want to do, I do, and the things I want to do, I don't do. Clinical, that's a compulsion. Half dead is I'm half alive enough to do it and half dead enough to not stop myself. You ever have a compulsion and you're kind of going, I mean, oh, I mean, sometimes Lent is, okay, Lord, let's try this again because my compulsions lasted all year. They didn't go away. I wished them away. And yet they keep coming back. That feeling of the thing I don't want to do, I do. That's what a compulsion is. That's when we know that we have this sort of operating system that needs healing because we're coming from a place very often up here, very often some unhealed parts that we just would wish go away. If we wish it too much, sometimes we ignore it as opposed to facing it and looking at it and talking about it. And you know, George, I'm gonna piggyback really quick when we yeah. think about the weapons we use. One beautiful thing that we have is the cross. That cross that we do on ourselves all the time. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I remember being at church camp and the priest going, we're just asking God to bless upstairs, downstairs, living room, and dining room. And that when he mm, talk about good. the back door in the back it's door. Good. And right now, we all have that weapon. We all have that armor of that's the good. cross. So remember, that's a beautiful thing to when our compulsions hit us and we see it and we understand it, we experience it and we know it and the passions are right there. Mm -hmm. Our cross is the weapon. That's beautiful. So please remember as we continue this journey. That's beautiful. Life. Thanks for sharing that. And we could also say we appreciate the life in the church when we look at it as one who knows how powerless the compulsion is, then even when we were doing prostrations earlier and your forehead hits the ground, it looks different from down there. It feels different from down there. And we get really grounded in like truly, Lord have mercy on this one right here. So all of everything within the sacraments, the, the absolute accessibility of this in that split second, because the devil's voice wants to say, nope, it's too late, you're already kind of like in flight. You might as well go for the whole tour, <laughs> right? In Disneyland, soaring over California, right? Soaring over my passions. Ooh, the view is so exciting. Okay, so we're, we're, we want to know that split moment matters. Joseph, when Potiphar's wife was saying, bro, he, was, he ran so fast out of there. That split second, she, she was going to tempt him. He got out of there. So even the split second of trying to access the life, the, 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 the connection with the life giver. And so... We saw how the devil works. We're going to take a peek at how God works. What I call the journey of love. So you notice, and I alluded to it, you know it in the parable that the guy is in the ditch. And the first thing it says, by the way, keep in mind, the super religious people didn't do this. The, super, the, the Samaritan who was in his heart did do this. In fact, if you're looking for the ingredients of leaning in, take note, here it is right from the scriptures. So he went there, and the whole going there is the story of God seeing us in the ditch, and he went there. That's the theology of the incarnation. This is what we talk about in relationships, what we call is empathy. This idea of, and this is why I call it a journey of love. Because guess when you are in a relationship, and the other person is like, all of a sudden, different. And you're living in the world like you're really good at the, remember the 2020 vision? 